get the welcome slide. There we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Hi. My name's Matias Duarte. I run the uh, design team here at Android, and I am super, super excited to welcome you all here today. This is the first Google I.O. where we can have an entire day of Android design sessions. We're going to have an entire day of design sessions here in this room. That's crazy. Is this really Google I.O.? Google I.O. with a day of design sessions? Um, yeah. No, that's really awesome. So obviously, you're here because you care about design. Whether you're a big team with an established track record and lots of published apps, or just a one-man shop who's just getting started, design matters. Design is going to make your app take it from great to insanely great. In January, we launched the Android Design Guide. It's a bunch of tools to help you make your app beautifully designed. I like to think of it as kind of like an open source library for design. It's a bunch of patterns and solutions that you don't have to think about. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you're not sure how to make it easy for users to navigate between screens, that's OK. We got a solution for you. You don't have to spend time testing or experimenting with that. If you're not sure how to make something legible or clear, it's OK. We got a solution for you. You don't have to figure out the basic metrics or grids or contrast or colors. But there's a lot more to design than just what's in the guide. And that's what today's sessions are all about. This morning, we start with Design for Success, which is an awesome overview of the entire design process, how to slot the design guide into the entire development process. And we're going to show you some examples of how to do that. Next we have, so you've read the design guide, now what? Which is a very practical session which is going to show you how to take all the principles that you learned in the design guide and turn them into perfect pixels on your screen. One of my favorite sessions and the one I'm most excited about is navigation. Because navigation is the essential backbone of any well-designed experience. It's what makes everything make sense. It's what gives people a sense of place and keeps them grounded. Uh, so I hope I'll see you there. Um, and then finally, we have a two-hour workshop, um, which I forget how, what we called it, <laughs> playing with patterns. Uh, playing with patterns is also really exciting because here you're going to see other developers who've actually taken the style guide um, and used it, used it to leverage their design and expand their design. The design guide is not a constraint. It's not a shackle. It's a tool. Uh, it's an accelerator. It's a way to boost your experience even further. And these guys uh, have done it. Uh, and they're going to show you how they did it and uh, hopefully give you some good tips on that. I hope you'll attend all of them. Uh, even if you can't, uh, the day's not over then. Because after the day of design sessions, the design team will be at the W Hotel Bar later in the afternoon. And if you have any questions or you just want to hang out with the design team and, and have some design uh, pixie dust rub off on you, uh, I hope you guys will come by and, and make friends. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Jens Nagel, Rachel Garb, and Nate Strew. Uh, from the design team who are going to teach you all about design for success. So give them a round of applause, please. Well, thanks, Matthias. So let's get started. Where does, it, where does it all begin? It usually begins with an idea. So you have an idea for an app. The thing is that, coincidentally, thousands of other app developers have one, too. And some of those ideas might actually be pretty close to yours. So it's really time to differentiate yourself, and we want to help you do it through design. One important way, as I said, to differentiate yourself is through design. And organizations realize that, and you, they usually verbalize it as look and feel. So look is a, you know easy enough to grasp concept as it speaks to the visual properties of an app. But feel is a little bit more nebulous and, and less clearly articulated. Uh, to clear this up where, where the feel is and what goes into a design team, uh, we want to look at the basic functions of a design team. For example, our team, the Android user experience team. And uh, yes, that, that is our logo. Nice. Um, <coughs> So first up uh, in, in the rundown of uh, sub-teams in our team is user experience research. So UX research shapes sort of the, the product and design direction by bringing in 
um, insights about users to the team. Uh, I'll introduce them in a little bit more detail in a bit, so let's go to the next one. All right, so visual design. Uh, this is next up, and this can go by a lot of different names, and you can call it what you will. It's imperative to the success of your app. Uh, visual design can span a wide breadth of disciplines from typography, iconography, animation, art direction, and design production. Okay. So uh, next up, interaction design. Uh, <clears throat> interaction designers define the structure and behavior of apps. So we organize functionality in the screens, we map out how the users will navigate between the screens, and then we identify all of the information and actions that need to appear on each screen. Now, although we do more line drawings than pixel-perfect mocks, our work is highly detail-oriented. And just like programmers, we need to make sure that every use case and error condition is accounted for. Next up is a, is a really exciting team. It's the prototyping team. And, and they make complex new interaction ideas tangible. Uh, so they, they create functional prototypes that allow us to experience a novel design uh, firsthand and evaluate it. And this is our uh, technical writer, Sean. He plays a, a dual role on our team. First, he creates help for Android. This can take a variety of forms, like uh, printed materials, uh, web-based help centers and uh, help that you see in the app. Uh, second, he shapes the voice of Android, and he does this uh, with his responsibility for our UI writing guidelines and working across the teams to make sure that terminology is used consistently in our apps and our system. And then um, last but not least is, you know, what I would like to call the, the glue. So these are the people that work across functions, and Matthias is one of them. He's the one that, that provides design direction to the team, but then we also have project management, and uh, generally people that, that are there to make the design machine run. So that is a fairly big team as far as design teams go, uh, you know, on average, I guess, um, maybe not for the scale of Android, but um, if in your organization you have access to a crack design team all dressed in black, like the guys on the left, you know, that's, that's great, you know, let them do their thing, but you might be in a situation where uh, you're on a smaller team, or maybe you're even this app army of one that, you know, one person playing multiple different instruments. Even in that situation where you have your hands full with you know, all sorts of things, uh, design is always doable, and today we want to show you how you can do that. Um, so where should you start it? Uh, where should you start with the design process? Well, a, a clue can actually come here from motivational psychology of all things. Uh, m some of you might be familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs basically postulates that all human behavior is geared towards uh, sort of fulfilling basic needs first before you progress to the, to the higher levels, to the, the uh, higher needs. Uh, so, for example, before I uh, you know, take care of the you know, safety of my employment, I, I probably want to breathe, uh, eat, and sleep. So these are the, the, the more basic needs here. So you might ask now, what does that have to do with app design? That's a good question. But it is the principle of how you should approach app design. App designers really should address their app's design needs by progressing through a similar hierarchy of needs. Uh, the contents here, of course, a little bit different. Uh, so you should address the design foundations first before striving to address higher level needs. Uh, in this pyramid, if you, if you just uh, cover the first three levels of the pyramid, you already have a really competitive app uh, that you know, measures up against the competition well. And it will be also an app that is sort of a good citizen on the Android platform in that it you know, uh, sort of follows the rules and regulations of the, of the UI. Uh, the Android design guide, which you will hear about more in a second, sort of gets you to that third level. It you know, mainly deals with the second and the third tier of uh, this pyramid. So as a takeaway, uh, make sure that you cover your bases. So before you do this, and that might be an instinct, right? Everybody wants you know, the pretty app that does exciting things like nice transitions and everything. But before you do this, really make sure that you do that. Uh, the base of the pyramid. 
because if you don't do that, that often equals the proverbial lipstick on a pig. So to give you a little bit more context about the design guide, uh, Rachel will give you a whirlwind tour. So, um, whoops. Show of hands, how many of you have visited this site? Okay, wow. and th that looks like at least three Great. quarters of the room. Terrific. Awesome. Okay, um, so for those who haven't yet seen this, this is the Android Design Guide. And uh, we launched it earlier this year and we're updating it regularly. It's for anyone who needs to make design decisions big and small whether you're a professional designer or you wouldn't be caught dead wearing all black. Uh, if you're designing an Android app, you should go check it out. Now, I'm not gonna give you a, a full tour because that would take way too much time, but I wanna point out a few pages that I think you'll find particularly helpful. Uh, so the first is application structure, uh, which Jens has up. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about today is introduced here, and you can think of it as sort of a one-page Cliff's Notes to designing Android apps. It um, provides overview of things like uh, hierarchical structure, navigation, layout, identity. It's a quick and easy read. The next thing I wanna show you is the action bar. Please read this and refer to it often. Uh, the action bar is the most important structural element of your app. Why is that? Uh, because in a very compact space, it does a lot of heavy lifting for you. Um, it's where you can present actions, whether they're primary like these, or whether they uh, are not so important and can go in an overflow menu. Uh, it's where you give your app an identity, and if your app has hierarchical structure, there's a way built in to navigate up to the top. If you want to provide views, different views on the information without the user leaving the screen, you have a way that they can switch the views. Now, the action bar pattern isn't just important because of all it does. It's also important because this will help your users learn your app more quickly. This has become a familiar and expected pattern in Android. All of Android's core apps use it. Uh, the next section I want to point you to is building blocks. This is where you'll find all of the information about the elements that you'll use to create apps, like lists, menus, buttons, tabs, and so on. Uh, you can see there's a lot of illustrations and examples, and this covers both interaction and visual design. And uh, finally, uh, design patterns, which you'll find under Get Started. Uh, but we're not gonna read through it right now. I think this is best read on your own, but I would like to take a moment to give you a little background on the design principles. So if you could switch to the slide. And So if your users could talk, here are some of the things that they'd be saying. Now how do we know this? Well, we did extensive user research. We went out and uh, observed and talked with a lot of Android owners. We saw some clear trends and themes, both things they loved and things they didn't like so much. And for ice cream sandwich, we wanted to do more of the lovable stuff. And of course, we wanted to stop doing the things that users found annoying, frustrating, and simply unlovable. So we took our user insights and we transformed them into short, memorable catchphrases that um, our team could work with and share with our teams and use on a day-to-day -day basis. We made sure that they were phrased in actionable ways. And we found that they've been really helpful, both at the start of a project when we're just figuring out broad directions to take, as well as when we're in the thick of it, working on granular design details and um, it's prioritizing bugs. So we invite you to use them too. They're very general and they apply to any and all apps. Um, now I'm gonna turn it back to Jens. Thank you, Rachel. So today we want to give you an applied overview of sort of how you can find your way up the design pyramid and uh, build an app that does what your users need it to do that is uh, structurally sound and also adheres to the Android design guide. Um, our example app for today is the Google I.O. app that uh, you all hopefully all had a chance to download onto your shiny new Nexus 7 tablets. If you don't have it or if you follow along from home, you can actually download it from the Play Store. And um, 
I was told that the code for this will also be open sourced uh, a week after the conference. So if you're a developer and you want to take a closer peek at how it was built, uh, you can do that. Uh, full disclosure, today is a little bit of a smoke and mirror session because we actually didn't design this app. Uh, it was Roman Nurik. You want to stand up? Hi. <laughs> Uh, some of you might know him through his work at uh, Android Developer Relations, but we picked it for this session because, yeah, A, it's a, it's a great app. Uh, B, it uses mostly framework elements, so all stuff that you will find in the Android Design Guide. And it's a good example of what you can achieve by applying the style guide and getting your app to that third level that we've been talking about because we're really not, not playing much in the app nirvana in the, in the top of the pyramid with this app. So let's get started at the bottom floor of our pyramid with utility and purpose. So as you begin your design project, it uh, pays off to heed the advice of a madman. And that is, of each thing ask, what is it in and of itself? So the fundamental question, what is your app in and of itself? Right. So what is the purpose of your app? What are the tactical goals that serve that purpose? And what are the things that are most important to your users? So why should you think about purpose? Because app design, just like building design, is or should be purpose-driven. Right? The purpose of a building, for example, has a profound impact on, on how it is built. Uh, let's look at an example of a purpose-built uh, building, like an airport, for example. Think about an airport from a, from a, tra a traveler's point of view. The, the mere fact that it is an airport already sort of shapes expectations of, uh, you know, what places are there, what the functional elements are, what processes are in that building. So, you know, if I say airport, you can probably conjure up a lot of things. And we've, if we all wrote them down in the room, they would probably match a lot. You would see a lot of check-in, dropping of ba bags, so uh, the, the process, for example, of getting onto an airplane is, is very similar everywhere. So you arrive, um, then you drop off your luggage, uh, you go through security. Uh, maybe before you leave, you want to grab a bite to eat or drink. And then finally, you get to the gate and get on the aircraft and leave. So regardless of the architectural style, regardless of what the airport looks like, um, Airports are really geared towards that common purpose. And they're, they're, by doing that, they're very consistent places, and users really expect them to be just that. <coughs> app, apps, in a sense, are no different, in that the purpose of an app also establishes expectations of functional places, such you know, as a screen with information on it. That's sort of a functional place akin to uh, you know, the check-in at an airport. Uh, then there are also actions associated with those functional places, uh, such as here, actions on an action bar. Uh, and there's also navigation, of course, between those functional places. So very, very similar, really, to, to how a building is, is constructed um, due to a purpose. So back to our I.O. app. Uh, now that we know that the purpose of an app really drives uh, its design, Let's get started by formulating the high-level uh, mission statement. And that could be our first high-level mission statement here, a conference guide that aids people while planning, exploring, and attending Google I.O. This is sort of your, your elevator speech. So if you have an app, you should have an elevator speech. You should be able to sort of communicate with just a sentence what your app is about, and that is probably then pretty close to its purpose. So now that we have that, we now need to establish the tactical goals that serve the purpose uh, and also get a, sun, uh, a sense of the functional places, actions, and navigations for our app. So to do that, we need to collect information, obviously, because we might not just be you know, subject matter experts about the app that we're building. So we, we essentially need to become just that, subject matter experts at what people's needs at conferences are. So we need to ask questions just like these. You know, what, what do people do before, during, and after a conference? Uh, what tools do they use? Maybe we, 
We know some of them, maybe we don't know all of them. Uh, what are their rituals? Uh, what currently works at conferences and where, where there might, might be friction points? Where, where are there opportunities of uh, where we can fix friction points with our app? So how would we go about this? So at, at Android, we're uh, happy to have Helena and her user experience research team, which we already talked about when we introduced the team. They're sort of what you would call expert gatherers, analyzers, interpreters, and distillers of information. They would actually go out to conference, uh, interview people, observe people, maybe shadow them for a while to see you know, what they're really doing, how they interact with other conference goers, what is important to them, what is not important to them. And actually what, what Helena probably would do is she would mo most likely uh, ask the designer, uh, the engineer, and the product manager that works on that particular project to come along. Case in point, here's a picture of a user study that we did a while ago where we visited actual users uh, to find out how phones and tablets, other electronic devices sort of fit into their daily lives. Um, the interesting thing here is that this guy in the picture is actually a software engineer. Uh, so he essentially changed his job description for the few weeks and sort of helped gather information uh, uh, on how users interact with devices. And uh, he did that uh, particularly on, on things that he would be coding a few weeks after. So he really had the user's perspective of you know, what was important, what was not important. So if you do that, if you, if you have a team uh, and you do information collection, you know, do bring uh, you know, project, uh, product managers and um, uh, software developers along because it really helps to focus your entire team on user wants and needs. Um, if, on the other hand, you're the, the app army of one that we already talked about, gathering information is still possible and it will pay off handsomely and anybody can really do it. So for the price, basically, of a coffee at Starbucks, you'll find people that will just love to sit down with you and, and talk a little bit about what they like and don't like about an app or about a particular electronic uh, um, device. Um, if you do the, the uh, information collection, uh, let's say, for example, you do a note-taking app, right? If you do a note-taking app, it really pays off to, to you know, go out to a couple of users, 10, 20 maybe, and ask them, you know, how do you manage notes in real life and sort of latch, you know, learn more about that and have your, your app really latch onto those processes. Um, bottom line is that uh, it, it's a good idea to make information gathering an integral part of your workflow. And in the end, you'll be glad you did because it also will serve your development time because you have a much better initial quality of your product. So back to our example here. So now Helena and I, who went to the conference, do a little bit of research. Uh, we came back and we brought home a bunch of interesting things to look at, such as printed materials, uh, you know, the proceedings and maps and, you know, what, whatever you get when you sign into a conference. Uh, then we would do some interviews, possibly some uh, questionnaires, and then we would take pictures, make observations, and see what, what people are actually doing at a conference. All this material sort of can help you to get context and get a better understanding of you know, what conference goers' needs are. So when we come back, we would take all that information, probably lock ourselves into a room for a while, and then analyze it, see, see what we got, and see where the morsels are that we can use for our apps. Um, so let's look at some other things in detail, such as here, the schedule master plan. Everybody has probably seen one. Um, so this gives you an at-a-glance overview of the sessions. And um, Helena actually also here brought back a copy of a schedule that a conference goer has marked up. Uh, so the fact that they carry it with them at all times and refer to it often already tells us that this is an important item. So this is an individualized item. Um, then uh, we brought back a map, which is of course helpful to find your way around at a conference, find restrooms, exhibitions, and of course the session rooms of the talks that you're interested in. And uh, I made an observation here that uh, sort of puts the maps in context with the schedule because users try to keep them close. 
So those little cues can be really important if you construct an app. Um, next up, the detailed daily schedule. This is basically gives you more, you know, the detailed information about a particular talk, who's, who's speaking, what it's about. And uh, Helena here explains how the session details really fit into the user's workflow for establishing a personal schedule. Um, people at conferences, you know, need to share information. Uh, of course, communication won't, uh, sharing won't quite look like this on an electronic device, but we can basically, you know, register the user need. People like to talk to each other, exchange information, share. So that is something that we want to uh, support in the app as well. Uh, and then the questionnaire here uh, crystallizes a social and organizational goal. Uh, another good clue for supporting some sort of uh, sharing in our app to allow people to tell other people what sessions they're going to. Um, now, interviews and general observations are great because they basically allow you to make accidental discoveries, things you maybe haven't even planned for, right? Sometimes you think, oh, well, we're going to collect information about this topic and that topic. But if you talk to people, if you observe them, you make those really nice accidental observations. And in this case, it seems like users need a helping hand to be reminded of some of their schedules and stay organized. So with all of that information in hand, we're, we're pretty well equipped to sort of formulate the tactical goals that serve our app's purpose. Since our research uncovered a lot of communication sharing topics, the sort of extending the goal a little bit to, uh, you know, saying a socially connected conference guide, so that is now part of our elevator speech. Um, to organize the goals a little bit, we you know, divided them up into different buckets before, during, and after. Before is mostly planning goals. Uh, some of those goals will carry over into the during phase, but the during phase is mostly about uh, you know, personal organization and uh, communication. Uh, we want to always uh, also service you know, the, the after conference uh, uh, aspect a little bit by allowing you to see a session recap so that you don't have to bring home the fat proceedings and also sort of share what you felt uh, I.O. was like for you. But clearly the need for a conference guide, uh, a conference guide is uh, the before and during phase. Um, so in our airport analogy, we said that a building's purpose drives the user's expectation of functional places. And translated to our app, that really means that our app's purpose as a conference guide shapes a user's expectation of certain familiar things to be available. And we you know, just collected some of those familiar things that people uh, will like to see uh, in an app and feel familiar when they see it. Um, so let's see how the real-world artifacts we collected match up to our goals. Uh, so the schedule master plan lets me individually plan conference, explore the program, find interesting sessions, and stay organized. So all of those organizational things. Um, the map uh, allows me to find my way around the conference. Uh, the session details let me read about the detail of the sessions. And uh, the bulletin board is sort of the, the uh, collection item, if you so want, for all the communication needs that people have at conferences. So we said that real life objects can be indicative of expected places for users. And you know, those objects that we just talked about, they have proven valuable many times over at conferences and reusing them in some shape or form in our app will make users feel like they're looking at something familiar. But you know, how should those uh, uh, important places be represented on an app? How should the UI for the bulletin board, for example, look like on an app? Would that be the best idea? You know, if you think about it, physical objects were really designed for the physical world and therefore play by slightly different rules than objects on your phone. Um, applying real-world objects to the virtual world can give you a lot of headaches if you're, you're approaching it too literally. 
Right, simply doing a one-on-one -on -one port of our bulletin board UI to the phone where the only things you can do is sort of add and remove uh, little snippets of information within a restricted place would you know, obviously simply not be a good idea because you know, the content is hard to scan on the phone. You probably would have to zoom in and out all the time. Um, you never know where new stuff, for example, pops up. You have a really inflexible, finite layout uh, and you probably, because of that, you probably have multiple layers since content might overlap. So, um, you know, doing a little bit of translation here would simply not work. Uh, so you should really spend some time if you have those real life artifacts that you collected in the real world and translate them into the virtual world. You know, what, think about, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, for example, um, how you want your objects to be recognizable, but you want them to be s sort of supercharged versions of the real life objects. Let's look at some examples um, of how you can convert real life objects uh, to virtual ones for the purpose of our app. So for example, if you look at the, the schedule master plan that we already visited, uh, visitors you know, mainly use it for exploring what sessions are available, so sort of a mini database for the conference but they also use it for establishing a, per, uh, a personal schedule. Um, the personal schedule out of a you know, multitude of events that is sort of very similar to what the agenda is doing on a, um, on, on a phone or you know, in, the, in the Android calendar, for example. <coughs> you can have an at-a-glance view of your day. You can add and remove things. So that, that sounds you know, really a model that works for, for a personalized schedule. Then uh, translating the master schedule to an agenda and a separate program object really matches well with our goals. It allows us uh, um, to sort of have a personalized schedule and the program uh, is sort of the database that uh, we want to access while we search for things by time, by place, or by track. Then the conference map, of course, has a strong analogy to you know, something like uh, the Google Maps app on Android. So we basically know what the interactions here should look like. So you can pinch to zoom, you can explore the content in certain significant places by clicking on the pins and so forth. And um, since we already have an agenda and sort of a session browse object, uh, the only thing that we're missing is a place uh, where users can learn about the details. So that is sort of uh, the same as the, the detailed schedule. Uh, so this is a, uh, also a good place to address you know, two of our remaining goals, and that is uh, sharing and uh, viewing uh, the session recap. So that's also a useful object. Um, of course, for communication, the, the modern analogy of a bulletin board is sort of a feed or a stream uh, where users that know about <coughs> Uh, that, that know about the name of a feed can rep uh, uh, post to it, reply to it. You can get to know people that way, uh, add them to your phone book and so forth. So now that we have uh, all those objects defined and we know that they're going to be useful in some shape or form, um, it, it makes sense to get an overview of what the functional relationships between those are. Uh, so what you can do is you can, for example, write down the objects that you collected, that you transfer it into the virtual world, and uh, oops, here we go, uh, and add uh, what the content of those objects will be. Like for example, agenda here consists of a timeline, sessions, and other events. Uh, so that already gives you, uh, you know. Uh, an approximation of what the content of that screen will be. Uh, second off, you can uh, add actions, and these are now actions that uh, you in can invoke on the object but that don't take you away from the object. And as a third step, you can add the navigation path, so basically functions that take you from one object to another object and the name of the function that basically collects the two. Uh, so this can be a really useful exercise for you to sort of get a, get a uh, first overview at you know, how complex your app is going to be and how everything hangs together. Right. <clears throat> so now let's get to the next step. Uh, we spent 
about half an hour of the talk already, <laughs> and they haven't drawn a single screen. And, and that goes to show that, that design, uh, you know, the foundation of the design often isn't about drawing screens, it's about collecting information. But now we're, we're at a point where we want to start drawing some screens, and with that I hand over to Rachel. Thanks, Jens. Okay, so let's design some screens. Uh, we usually recommend starting with the top level screen. Now why? It's where users' first impressions are formed. Uh, it orients users to what the app can do and how they get around. And in many apps, it's going to be the, the place where users spend the most time. So this really is a make or break screen. So let's continue to use the IO app as an example, and we'll take a stab at designing the top level screen. But I want to start by pondering this question. What should be the hero of this screen? And what I mean by that, what will help users accomplish their most important tasks in the shortest amount of time? What will make them conquer the challenges of attending I.O.? And what will save the day? Uh, if you're not into the hero analogy, there are other ways to phrase this question. Want to throw out some ideas? Top dog. Top dog. The big cheese. Yeah. Cool. So. All of the research and thinking that Jens walked us through so far is going to help us figure out what the hero is. Now, as we've learned, uh, normally at conferences like this, uh, people get a program and they go through it page by page and they circle things that look interesting. And then if they get a master schedule, they then transfer those circles to the master schedule and they carry it with them wherever they go. So that's pretty powerful right there. This is their personal agenda, and it aids them in planning and attending the conference. It's very time-critical information, and it needs to be at the surface. So let's make the, let's make the agenda the hero of our top-level screen. Now, let's sketch out very roughly how that could look on a phone and a tablet. Uh, I like to start with the action bar. It's already in place there, as you see. Let's put in some branding and uh, plan for an action overflow. This is a place where we can have a menu for secondary actions that are not used so often, like settings and help. And of course, our hero, ta-da, the agenda. But at the beginning, the agenda will be mostly empty. So it's important that our top-level screen also provides a way for users to find things to fill up the agenda. There are two key ways that conference goers approach this. Um, first, they would start with a track like Android, and see what sessions are available, and then pick a few that are interesting to add to their agenda. Another way that they would do it is uh, to choose a time slot, see what sessions are available, and pick one. Let's make sure that our top-level screen supports both. On a tablet, we have room to add a menu of the various tracks in a second column. On the phone, we don't have that luxury, so Let's have tabs. We can have one for the agenda and another for the tracks menu. Now, uh, when you are using tabs, it's important that you think of them as being the same part of one screen. It's not two screens, it's one. So this is all still part of our top level screen as far as we're concerned. Now, users can touch the track that they want to get a list of sessions. And of course, we know that users also like to touch uh, a time slot to get a list of offerings, so let's offer that too. Now, if that's all we offer in the top level screen, it'd, it'd be way better than the, the old paper method, right? But we can do even better. After all, this is an interactive conference program. So let's add some things here. Um, how about search? We could let users search the program for a particular keyword in sessions. This seems important enough to put in the top level or in the action bar of the top level menu. Um, we could also give them one touch access to a map of the conference screen. One way we could do that is to have another button in the action bar, or another way we could do it is to have a button in the explore menu, which is what you see in the final app. And since conferences have become popular venues for heavy social networking activity, uh, why don't we give that some prominence on the top level screen too? Now, I could go on, but I, I think you get the idea. Uh, you start with the most basic goal and place the objects and actions that relate to it. Uh, next, you figure out what other objects and actions might be nice to have on the screen. 
and, or at least accessible from it, and you work those in too. Okay, next, let's talk a little bit about lower level screens. Uh, they serve various purposes, and here are a few examples of the role that they can play in your app. Uh, one thing they can let you do is drill deeper into data. For example, uh, the browsing a photo album in the gallery. Another thing they can let you do is edit data, like when you're composing a message in Gmail. And another thing they can let you do is consume data, for example, reading a book. Let's work on a lower level screen in the I.O. app. In this case, let's work on the screen that appears when you touch a time slot. This is an example of uh, drilling deeper into data. So I like to start by giving the screen a title so that it conveys, conveys a purpose and a sense of place. Uh, the user is going to get here by touching a time slot in the main level, or the top level screen, and then uh, arrive here and expect to see a list of sessions. So it kind of makes sense that the date and time would be a good title. But it's not just a time slot, it's a time slot at the I.O. conference. Uh, carry your branding throughout your app. It's another way that you can establish a sense of place. Now, did you notice that we're using a smaller logo here than we did on the top level screen? We're doing that because uh, we have a longer label and we have other actions that we're eventually going to want to place. This will give us more room for that. Uh, next, let's bring in the hero of the screen, which is the list of sessions in the time slot. Uh, users will be able to touch one to get session details. Now, you can imagine that users will probably alternate a lot between viewing the list of sessions and reading session details. Um, I call this pogo sticking, and um, on the tablet, because we have more space, we may be able to cut down on that pogo sticking. So, let's see if we can make use of the space by having two panes where the user selects a time slot on the left and sees details on the right. Um, in the actual app, uh, Roman did a twist on the two pane layout where you see a portion of the details pane just kind of peeking out until you select a session and then the details takes over. Now, either of these approaches are great for combining two levels of hierarchy on larger screen sizes. Uh, but the phone doesn't have space for a second column, so we'll eventually need to design a separate screen for session details. So at this point, the tablet lets users see what sessions are available and details for the currently selected session, but we also need to let them add a session to their agenda. So let's add a way to do that on the tablet. One way we could do it is to have a button as part of the session info. Um, another way we could do it would be to have an icon in the action bar, like you see in the actual app. So now the screen fulfills its entire goal, but there's one more important thing left to do. Because this is a lower level screen, include an up arrow. It's the standard way in Android to enable navigating up the hierarchy. Now this is different than the system back key. That's for historical navigation. Uh, as Matthias mentioned, a few of our colleagues will be digging deeper into the topic of navigation in Android in this room today at 11.30, and we hope you'll attend. Okay, now the screen fulfills its goal. It uses the standard convention for navigating up, uh, the next step is to decide if we want anything else to offer any other objects or actions on the screen. For example, it would be nice to bring up a map to the location of your session uh, or share details of the session with your favorite network. So that's an example of a lower level screen and you can repeat this process for all the screens in your app to build up your full set of sketches. Now, the sketches you just saw, which uh, we call wireframes, they didn't, they didn't require any special artistic ability or design training to create. It's really all about drawing shapes and text and arranging them into defined areas. And you don't need any specialized tools. Uh, the Android designers all have different ways of wireframing. I use a tool called OmniGraffle for the Mac, and Jens uses uh, Adobe Illustrator, and other folks on the team prefer paper, paper and pencil, like Nate over here. All right. That's a lot of stuff and, and great, great information. So uh, what's the next thing we can do here? Uh, and I think one of those things is bringing these wireframes to life. And one of the easiest ways to get started, 
uh, you know, whether you're one of those app army of one uh, or you're a dedicated visual designer on a larger team, uh, is to spend time on the Android design site because it's rich in tools that help you get started and will continue to update as we go along. Uh, <clears throat> Rachel mentioned earlier one of the most important resources to be considering uh, is the building block section. And as we mentioned, it's made up of Android's ready to use system and framework elements like tabs or buttons or text fields. And I can't stress enough the importance of getting familiar with these pieces uh, as you begin to craft your scenes in, in higher fidelity. Uh, fortunately, we've made it a little easier to put them to practical use when applying visual designs. Uh, the Android design site now has downloadable building block stencils uh, and source files for a variety of common different software applications, uh, and the stencils will allow you to quickly visualize your app uh, using real Android UI. And I'm gonna go into a little detail about that later. Uh, the great thing is these things are vector-based, so it's easy to scale for multiple resolutions or customize things like colors and fonts uh, should you choose. And anyone with a working knowledge of Photoshop or Illustrator or Fireworks uh, will find it a breeze uh, to put these stencils to good use. I also want to note that the download section also includes uh, common system icons, color swatches, and the stunning Roboto typeface that's used throughout Android. I'd recommend you download all of these tools. Uh, so next up, you're gonna wanna target some specific form factors uh, for your hero screen visual designs. Uh, as you all know, uh, Android powers millions of phones and tablets, uh, many with different screen sizes and resolutions, and you'll wanna support as many of those as you have time. Uh, and Rachel showed us how she kept the phone and tablet layouts in mind when constructing the wireframes. Uh, you'll need to do the same when applying visual design. And don't forget about orientation. Uh, you wanna make sure your design support both landscape and portrait. But for the purpose of this demo, uh, let's keep it simple. Uh, we'll pick one. We'll go with the Galaxy Nexus and a portrait orientation. Okay. So at this point, it's really valuable to identify the key screens and components that you're gonna need to mock up in visual design. And while complex wireframes may include a lot of screens, it's usually not necessary to create pixel perfects for every version. You wanna pick the hero screens that <coughs> showcase the app's core functionality. Usually it's a mix of top level and lower level screens uh, in a variety of different uh, resolutions and orientations. So for our purposes, let's focus on the top level agenda view. Now, here's a quick look at the Photoshop stencils uh, that are available on the download. You should notice that they're available for both uh, light and dark UIs, and this is done to support system theming. And themes are Android's way of applying a consistent visual style across an app or activity. Uh, getting comfortable with these themes uh, will go a long way in helping you build apps that complement the general visual language of Android. So you can choose from three system themes uh, when, when you're starting to build your apps. Hollow Light, as you can see here, uh, leveraged in Gmail. Uh, and a variation, Hollow Light with dark action bars, that's shown here in Talk. Uh, this is really good for when you want a little more visual differentiation between the action bar and the page content. And here's Hollow Dark, which you can see in the settings screen. So you wanna make sure you choose a theme that matches the needs and design aesthetics you're looking for. It's also worth mentioning that if you want a more distinct look, using one of these themes as a starting point for personal customization is a great idea. In the case of the IO app, however, let's use the Hollow Light variation with the dark action bar. So we've identified a key screen, we've picked a theme, let's start laying out some of the core building blocks of the I.O. app. Now I'm gonna to refer to Rachel's wireframes as a guide to the objects and actions that should be included here. So I'm gonna start with mocking our hero agenda by using the building blocks from the stencil kit. I'm gonna start with a blank canvas, which happens to be the default hollow light background, and next I'm gonna add some global system elements that frame your app, such as the status bar, in the navigation bar. And next, as Rachel mentioned, the 
the action bar is a huge part of the Android UI. So let's add that to our canvas from our stencil kit. So you want to notice that the stencil kit comes preloaded with the up indicator as well as uh, the action overflow. And these are very, very useful since most of Android's UI will leverage these functions. Uh, and now with the action bar in place, we've got not only the most important structural element to your app, but also a great opportunity, as, as Rachel mentioned, to brand or title your page. So let's do that by adding the IO launcher icon and page title. Because this is a top level screen, I've removed the up icon used in the lower level screens. Uh, and while we're here, I wanna pay special attention to talk a little more about the importance of the launcher icon within your app. So the launcher icon is usually the first impression a user will have with your product. So it's important to have the character of this icon reflect the brand or the character that you're hoping to achieve. It's used all over the place. It's used in the Play Store, it's used on Android's customizable home screen, uh, and also within your app. So it's really, really important that your icon is clearly legible on all types of backgrounds. You're also gonna wanna keep the metaphor simple when doing your launcher icon. Overly complex icons will look great on really high resolution, but, that's, but they can really scale poorly, uh, resulting in a loss of detail and clarity. And you know, not everybody is a visual designer uh, or a pixel, pixel perfectionist, but uh, a lot of users are gonna notice a poorly executed launcher icon. And when they do, chances are, they think your app is too. So really pay attention to this one. So next, we're gonna address the most important actions people take. And we saw this in Rachel's wireframes. In this case, we're gonna add search and refresh to the action bar in addition to the overflow menu. If there's not enough room, as Rachel mentioned earlier, uh, additional actions could also be surfaced in a split action bar or within that action overflow. So, as I mentioned earlier, the design site provides downloads for the common predefined icons that you can use to mock up your UIs in both hollow light and hollow dark themes. And it also includes some handy implementation notes. We highly recommend you take advantage of these. Uh, it's not only less work for you guys, but it's also gonna have better continuity with the system. And if these pre-canned icons don't meet your needs, the design guide also has detailed specs for creating your own uh, under iconography in the style section. All right, so back to our I.O. app. Uh, next, I'm gonna throw in some tabs uh, from the stencils for navigation between our top level views. And because the agenda view is really, really similar to a standard framework list view, we'll grab that from the stencil. In this case, I'm using a two-line hollow light list. Note that the templates also include common list elements such as section dividers, which will be perfect for breaking our agenda up into days, list action icons, and default contact avatars. So for our purposes, I'm gonna remove the last couple of bits though that avatar could come handy if we were mocking up the social stream. And like that, in a few quick steps, you can bring your sketches and wireframes to life. It's really that easy. And by following our design guide and using the resource we've put at your fingertips, you can quickly visualize a UI that not only meets its functional purposes, but also begins to approach app nirvana. So why stop here? Uh, let's look at some of the ways customizing the building blocks can apply to our I.O. app and help take it to that next level. Great place to start is with the action bar again. So I've gone a little darker and applied a subtle pattern to it. And I've also injected a little color with the tabs. You'll notice what a difference the addition of color adds to the dynamic of the page and visual hierarchy in the objects on the screen. The action bar recedes while the top level tabs come forward, uh, giving you a clear indication of where you are and where you can go. It also reinforces the brand color used in our launcher icon. So it would also help if our agenda view not only had a daily breakdown, but an hourly breakdown. So using the stencil kit and referencing the metrics and grid section of the design guide, 
It's simple to visualize this customization of a standard list view. And there we have it, something that resembles very, very closely what the final product, uh, what the final product looked like. So with, a fall, with just a few small tweaks uh, to our stencils, referencing our wireframes, uh, we've succeeded in quickly visualizing a functional and differentiated act experience very, very simply. It's also super easy to visualize alternate approaches by using these building blocks. Uh, when doing custom work, pay special attention to type and iconography contrast when you're adjusting these UI elements. It's really important that these things are still legible. Now hopefully most of you guys are staying in the room for the next talk, which Matthias alluded to earlier, uh, called So You've Read the Design Guide, Now What? Uh, this session is gonna dive a little deeper into some of the things we've discussed today and give you more practical strategies for applying fit and finish to your app. We highly recommend you check it out. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Rachel. Okay, so um, we're at the end of our talk now, and if there's one message that we want you to take away today, it's this. When it comes to creating Android apps, Design is always doable. So the key is to start at the bottom of the pyramid and work your way up. Your target users, your purpose, and the Android Design Guide will help you along the way. Good luck and thank you. And uh, now we'd like to invite Matthias and Roman to come up on the stage and help us answer some of your questions. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. So we have a few minutes for a, a few questions. Uh, we got some mics in the center if folks want to ask. Um, or you could raise your hand. Or we could just stand here and look pretty. <laughs> One question in the front. the asset names. Okay, so that's, the question was sense. about the naming of the assets in the download pack of icons. Um, and what's the, what's the answer to that? Uh, the answer should be that we'll update those so it's easier for you to do that. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, next question. Oh, fly-in menu, you mean the, the pattern that you see in the Google Plus app? Well, just like our products, we don't like to pre-announce anything for the style guide. But um, yes, uh, just for you, I will answer that we are working on, on updates for the style guide for that pattern as well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we got a... Oh, okay, audience question. Um, most of the times, as developers, we try to follow the design guidelines that you're given. But when we are working for somebody else, and uh, a customer asks us to create rich application, and when we show this design guideline, they say, we want to follow another device, and we want to mimic the same experience on both the devices. So how to answer that? Right. So that's an excellent question. Um, as a, as a brand or as a company, you want to build a consistent identity across all the platforms that you build on. But at the same time, you want users to be delighted and uh, successful in the platform that they're on. We actually have a specific section in the design guide that shows how to translate some of those elements. And so if you're dealing with a customer um, or a manager who doesn't understand that, that's a good place to start. The biggest principle to keep in mind is, the design guide is just that. It's a guide. It's actually intended to be very flexible with regards to your branding. Um, in fact, I'd invite you to come to the Playing with Patterns session at the end of the day to see very practically how people adapt the design guideline while still maintain the integrity of their own app. Um, the reason why you want to follow the design guide for all of the important principles is that you may feel really good about having consistency across all these different patterns, all these different platforms, but a user is only using one platform, maybe two, the desktop and their device. And the desktop experience and their device are going to be completely different. If the experience on the device is different than what they expect, they're actually going to have a worse time. That's a competitive disadvantage. 
If you have a competitor that is actually hewing closer to the design guide in terms of metrics, contrast, even ex simple expected things like our tabs at the top or the bottom, your competitor all of a sudden has an advantage. Um, and that's really the key point I would stress. Okay. And uh, one more question. Okay. With your uh, latest, few of the latest apps, you started introducing um, navigation elements on the bottom. Like that never used to be a standard in earlier, right? Like now you have a search bar and you have more navigation elements right above the. With Ice Cream Sandwich, we introduced the split action bar that allows you to put actions from the action bar at the bottom of the screen to basically enable us to do things like uh, small phone layouts, where you still want to have a lot of contextual header information at the top, still have important actions at your fingertips without creating this like layer cake stack at the top of your app. That's not actually used for navigations. Those are really used for actions themselves. Thank you. Sure. All right, we've got, we've got a line here. So let's see how many of them we can get through. Based on the look and feel of the UI elements uh, of these design guidelines, it appears to me that these are specifically for, for native apps. How do these uh, design guidelines apply to mobile web apps and hybrid apps? Well, they are the Android design guidelines. Um, do you want to talk? I'll take it. All right, I'm taking <laughs> this one. So I think web apps obviously have the incredible power of being deployed on multiple platforms. But just like any app that is trying to be deployed on multiple platforms, it wants to be quite as native as possible for the exact same reason of the last question. Um, I think with those, you have to be a little bit more careful. But things like using basic metrics and using uh, 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 enough of the contrast and typography conventions are going to make your web apps fit into the rest of the Android native app world. Thank you. All right. It looks like we have time for one last question, and then we'll sign off. That's me, probably. Uh, That's you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I don't see any other hands. My question for you, um, um, how much time do you spend on the design part? What's the ratio between design and, and development? And at what time did Roman uh, came in doing the development? So the funny thing about, about Google I.O. is that it's a, it's a three-day conference, so you can't really spend a long, long, long time uh, designing and developing something for a three-day conference. Um, so actually, the, the design and development took about uh, two or so months. Um, and it was an integrated kind of effort. Um, a lot of people were involved. So it wasn't really design and then develop. It was really an iteration cycle over about a few months. I'd like to say one. I'd like to say one last thing to, to close on that. First off, that's a great example about how design is always doable, even if you have a very, very short timeline. Um, and also a great example about how using the standard Android framework elements and the design guide can make your app development much faster, because you're not reinventing the wheel. But the other point that Roman made is also critical. Design and development is not a waterfall process. It's iterative, right? You want to get broad strokes sketched in. Think of design like progressive JPEG decoding. Right? You want to get the light and the dark parts really blurry first, make sure you're not making any critical mistakes, and then keep refining quickly. Yeah, I think we're cutting you off. <laughs> come, come join us for drinks later. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to the presenters. <laughs>